welcome to think in the podcast series the kautilya school of public policy hello everyone welcome to think in podcast i'm nirmal ganesh and today in our studio we have vijay gokhale who is a distinguished diplomat an author and an academic welcome to kautilya sir how thank are you thank you thank you how was your transition from diplomatic career to teaching and writing on china well it was relatively easy nirmal because i had made up my mind that when my career in government comes to an end i will move to another city and i will start a new career um the obvious uh, career path was to continue some of the work that i had already done in the government and that included my focus on china so i took china studies as the main focus i decided to teach about china and it have decided to write on china and in the past 3 years i uh, have written 3 books uh, written a number of long form essays yes. uh, and also given a number of interviews on this subject yes. so i think i've slipped fairly easy into my second career it's good to know about it sir before diving deep into china our viewers would be interested to know what interested you to get into foreign service well uh, you know i grew up in delhi in the 1970s and delhi is a government town so there is a natural inclination to try for the civil services and in the in the college uh, and the university where i studied a lot of my contemporaries and peers were also giving the examination so i was motivated to give that examination and i was lucky enough to clear it yes. um some of my relatives were also in government okay. and uh, so i knew something about the career and uh, it's it attracted me so um, overall i felt Uh, this is something which will suit me something which is of my interest and i was lucky enough to get the foreign service because i was particularly keen that if i cleared the civil services exam i would like to do diplomacy in the initial phase of your uh, ifs training what were the similarities and differences that you noticed between indian and chinese civilizations well i think there are very fundamental differences between the two civilizations although in the west they look at us as oriental civilizations and therefore somewhat similar i would say broadly speaking chinese civilization is based on a confucian sense of order and stability in other words the preference and the expectation is that uh, life will be stable and predictable and if something unpredictable happens then there is confusion in that society I think Indian civilization has evolved on the understanding that we cannot control everything in our lives mm-hmm. in particular you cannot control the forces of nature and okay. therefore you have to adjust to the environment around you adapt to the environment around you and therefore I think we are far better at handling uh, chaos if I may use that word mm-hmm. than the Chinese are they are better at putting things in order compared to us Uh, so there is a uh, uh, quite a difference in our environmental conditioning as two different people mm-hmm. of course there are similarities as well some of those similarities are cultural buddhism went from uh, india to china of course it was adapted there but uh, um, and we the meeting point of our two civilizations is in the southeast of asia and there you see how these two civilizations came together so there are fundamental differences and there are similarities as well yes. uh my next question would be sir uh, as we are recording this interview on the teachers day would you like to share a story about any teacher like personality who played a key role in your life well i am not sure whether any of my school or university teachers played a key role in my life but certainly in my career there were a number of uh, my senior colleagues who in a sense i consider to be my mentors because i was taught a lot about diplomacy by them and i would certainly like to name two of them one is of course mr shiv shankar menon who went on to become the national security advisor of india he was my uh, boss you might call it on more than one occasion uh, and then of course uh, i had another uh, very very close friend who was also my boss mr nalin suri okay. both of them also were subsequently ambassadors to china I learned a lot from them in not only in terms of China but in terms of what it is to be a better diplomat. So if I am to name uh, two teachers on on this uh, day the teachers day I would name these two people as those who had the greatest influence on my life. Yes. 
So now let's get into your favorite topic, China. You often mention that CCP is not a monolith and there are factions inside the party. While I was doing a reading for this interview, I got to know about April 5th protests of 1976. Could you please share the significance of that event? So that is the incident which uh, is known as the first Tiananmen crisis. Uh, we, are, uh, we are now coming to the end of the Cultural Revolution period in China, 10 years of great disruption in people's lives, great disruption in the economy. And uh, China had suffered as a result of Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution. He was also coming towards the end of his life. He was very ill by then. And uh, six months before Mao died, his closest advisor, Zhou Enlai, who was the pre premier of the People's Republic of China, passed away in April. And the Chinese people had a great regard for this man. They felt that he was rational, he was balanced, he was interested in the lives of the Chinese people. And on his passing, they, they saw the opportunity not only to mourn him, but to express their frustration, their anger, their concern at the disruption that had occurred in their lives in, for the past 10 years. Uh, and therefore, when they came to lay wreaths or to lay flowers or to write poems uh, at Tiananmen Square, they took this occasion also to express their unhappiness. And that is what led to the first Tiananmen Square incident. Uh, it led to great concern in the party that uh, the Communist Party's position was being challenged. It led to a temporary uh, backlash in terms of the radical conservative faction regaining control and exiling Deng Xiaoping, who was the vice premier. But eventually Mao died six months later and uh, China turned its face away from Mao's cult to reform opening up and to the immense progress we see in China today. So it was a very pivotal event in China's history and one which um, is not remembered because the second Tiananmen incident of 1989 is the much more remembered incident. Sir, in the context of protest, I just have a follow-up question, sir. There were student protests in 1987. What went wrong in that phase that Hu Yaobong had to pay for with his job? So as I uh, have always said, we should not see the student protests in China, whether it is 1987 or 1989, as democracy movements. Certainly, there were demands for more democratization. That is a normal part of any protest. But the protests were principally on matters of direct concern to students, unemployment, high school fees, inflation, and so on. And members of the Communist Party tried to utilize these protests to advance their political careers. Now, it is now widely believed that Hu Yaobang, who was a relatively liberal communist leader, wanted to use the student protests to gradually separate the Communist Party and the state of the People's Republic of China and to bring it more into what is a normal uh, ambit of, of government and state, the separation of party and state. Certainly other leaders like Deng Xiaoping did not want that because they wanted the Communist Party to be the sole holder of power in the, in the People's Republic of China. And therefore, after the protests were put down, uh, the leaders got together and felt that the general secretary of the party, Hu Yaobang, had tried to exploit the situation to the party's disadvantage and removed him from office. So it was a, a, a political struggle which uh, converged with the student protests and the students were used in this political struggle. And that was really the, 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 the case in 1989 as well. So after 1987, as we know, there was a Tiananmen incident where the protester, protesters were suppressed brutally by the state force. And your new book deals extensively on what happened after that incident in China. Sir, my question is, right after that incident, the top leadership wanted to get rid of welfare measures. How did they make this reform possible? That's a very interesting question. See, 1989 was important because the party realized they could not continue to claim legitimacy solely on the basis that they had freed the Chinese people in 1949 from slavery, feudalism, and semi-colonialism. That they needed now to deliver the economic goods to the people, a better life, uh, better education, better health care, better social security. 
Uh, now, while they had good intentions, they were hobbled with the earlier communist system, okay. which promised everybody that we will look after you from the cradle to the grave. In other words, we will ensure free education, free medicine, free housing, free food, and free retirement benefits. By the 1990s, all these freebies had come at an enormous cost to the state budget. And the People's Republic of China's budget could simply not fund all this and at the same time put money into infrastructure growth, into new housing, into new economic activity. The challenge was how to withdraw these benefits without another Tiananmen-like incident occurring. So you had a very, very charismatic prime minister in Churongji. Uh, he had been the mayor of Shanghai, which is China's largest city, something like Mumbai, the commercial and financial capital. And he had experimented with this. And his view was that if you increase the share of the economic cake, in other words, if you expand the financial capabilities of the state, you can gradually reduce uh, these benefits and supplement them with new schemes of insurance uh, or, or Medicare such that the people would not mind because while these privileges are being reduced, their incomes are going up. Mm. And it was this remarkable ability of the state in those 20 years to consistently ensure that incomes went up okay. while subsidies were being reduced that was able to ensure that public anger did not uh, spill into the streets because the objective people felt was the government intends to improve my life year after year and if I can see that happening then really if I have to give up a little of what I had earlier that's okay for me. So it is uh, I think a very masterful handling of the transition from a complete welfare state to what is uh, a capitalist model of governance. At this point, I want to divert a bit to India. As you mentioned in your book, Chinese government officials used to give special treatment to Western CEOs. At that time, the policy makers in India were focusing elsewhere. Don't you think India missed an opportunity of being a manufacturing hub? I think India missed a big opportunity. We uh, missed out that entire wave of foreign direct investment in the 90s. More importantly, we missed out the wave of a relatively free and open trading order which is what China took advantage of. It became a manufacturing hub not only because it was able to attract investment, but because it was able to export to markets which were relatively open. But notwithstanding that, uh, I think today India is in a sense learning those lessons from China, learning from China's mistakes as well. And uh, I think our economic growth is much more balanced as a result. We are not simply dependent on exports. We are also equally focused on domestic consumption. And if we look at China's problem today, the problem is that the export uh, markets are closing, but they are not able to substitute that fall in exports with getting their own population to consume the goods. And that is leading to structural problems in the Chinese economy. So. Yes, we missed an opportunity in the 90s, but I think we have picked up from what we missed out and I think we are progressing down a more balanced road. Coming back to our topic, sir, China played very well in hiding intentions in front of the West during Xiang and Hu era. When do you think US realized that China is chal challenging its position? So when the current president, uh, President Xi Jinping took office, uh, for a <clears throat> couple of years, the United States and the West, and perhaps the rest of the world as well, imagined that he would continue the policies of his predecessors, simply because China had benefited so greatly from the Western-led liberal order. Xi Jinping, however, had different ideas. He felt that China was now economically strong enough, militarily capable enough, diplomatically influential enough to strive for a larger role in the world. And there was the feeling in China that the West would never give China its due at the high table. Uh, one uh, good sign of this was the fact that although China was by 2011 the world's second largest economy, it was not invited to join the group of seven nations, the group of seven developed nations. In fact, those the G7 would talk of it not only being based on the size of the economy, but the value system, and that China did not follow that value system. So. 
overall china felt it must carve its own space out and it proceeded on that on that course it has taken the world a little longer to realize that china's uh, course in a sense challenges western dominance both in the economy and uh, in geopolitics uh, now this is of course combined with america's own relative decline i use the word with great care because china, america is still the world's largest economy the world's largest military and the world's most technologically advanced country but it can no longer be unipolar and therefore the united states began to feel vulnerable as china became uh, more and more powerful there were structural problems between them both in geopolitics and in economics and it is around the time that president trump got elected that a realization began to grow in the elites of the united states in the governmental systems of the united states that perhaps china was going to be a competitor and not a partner and i think that is pretty much well established now in american thinking um and uh, i think american policy is shaped now in order to li to limit china's capability to compete and china's policy is increasingly being shaped by the desire to compete with the united states where this will lead us is a matter of speculation of course so now moving to asia right after the 1997 financial crisis china created a rapport with asian countries but how do you think asian countries are responding to changing dynamics of china and usa yeah that's a that's really a very very good question and it really deserves a lot of uh, research in my opinion in the 1990s i think the chinese leadership recognized one important fact that is that countries in southeast asia were no longer interested in securing security guarantees from the west because the soviet union which was the ideological threat to the rest of the world the spread of communism had collapsed therefore what they were looking now for was economics economics became the driver of governments and societies throughout the world including yes. in south asia yes. now china understood that shift from a security driven to an economic driven policy in most countries and catered to that this is when china began to export more to these countries offer loans offer grants uh in the case of the southeast asia when the asian financial crisis occurred they deferred loan payments they opened their markets even more and as a result uh they became a uh, uh, a bulwark for southeast asia to anchor their own economies to that was what really created an enormous dip uh, diplomatic influence for the chinese in southeast asia such that by 2005 or 6 Uh, although the united states was still the largest investor in southeast asia the chinese were seen as uh, much more beneficial from the economic perspective of course now what has happened is the chinese have taken on this greater security role the as you are well aware what is happening in the south china sea they have militarized the south china sea they have rejected the claims of others for southeast asian countries claim parts of the south china sea and the more aggressive assertive chinese behavior has resulted in some sort of a backlash but you know nirmal we have to be careful not to think that this is a backlash which is going to lead to a distancing away from china and a moving towards the united states because china is still the largest economic player in asia it is still the economy on which the southeast asian economies are dependent it is also a proximate neighbor with great military capacity so for all these reasons uh, the position of the asean countries has been we need both we don't want to choose between the united states and china we need both for our own prosperity and security and therefore whatever china does subject to it not going to war with any of these countries they will try to accommodate they will try to moderate the chinese they will try to bring in greater american participation but they will never Uh, declare china to be an adversary okay sir moving a bit to africa china entered into africa for resources and also played a role of arms supplier now it is playing debt trap diplomacy how much do you think is africa important in china's grand strategy i think africa is important in every country's grand strategy including ours simply because it is a continent of 1 billion people it has enormous 
natural resources from energy to raw materials that are used in the sunrise industries and it is the next growth story uh, because the population of most of Africa is going to increase. It is not in a declining trend, it is in an in increasing trend, right? So for any country, Africa becomes important. For China, it became very important because uh, China is the world's factory and all the supply chains needed those resources whether it was iron ore, whether it was lithium, whether it was manganese or whether it was natural gas to power the Chinese economy. Now, uh, I think it is uh, a fact that China has been exploitative, but we should not imagine it is the only exploitative power in the African continent. Through the 19th and 20th centuries, this is what the Europeans did. And after the Second World War, this is what the Americans and the Soviets did as well. The Chinese are just the latest uh, uh, power that is uh, using extraction of minerals uh, as uh, uh, an important part of its policy. What is it doing in return? It is meeting the expectations of those governments in other sectors such as infrastructure for instance. Uh, and there we cannot deny that China has built significant infrastructure of, of a certainly, certainly of a reasonable to high quality which has improved the lives of those people. Debt diplomacy is part of that, but it cannot explain the full reasons for what China is doing there. Much of what China is doing there benefits its own economy as well. If it exports infrastructure, that means export of Chinese steel, Chinese cement, yes. Chinese plate glass, Chinese machines, right. Chinese technology. Uh, that all benefits the Chinese economy. Similarly, import of raw materials over a long period of time reduces the cost it help uh, and the benefit to the African countries that the mines are developed with no additional loans from the World Bank. The debt diplomacy has uh, been used by China to pressurize some countries, but you have to look at it from the perspective of the African countries. Their main job as governments are to satisfy their people. If they are able to do so, very few governments actually look at debt. They look at debt as something that will occur, occur five or ten years down the road, whereas the bridge or the airport gets built right now. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, we have to be careful in attributing debt diplomacy as a sign that the whole of Africa is going to turn against China. Mm -hmm. There are certainly areas, regions, maybe populations in some places which are resentful of what China is doing. But by and large, the Africans feel that China gives them a reasonable alternative on whom to depend for capital, for technology, for equipment as compared with the West, which until 1990 was the only uh, set of people you could depend on and the West was equally exploitative. So, uh, you know, it is a question of uh, which is the lesser evil and uh, it is not a question of China is the big evil. Sir, in the context of Malacca Strait, why do you think China feels insecure about the Quad grouping? Well, I think they are uh, worried because the Malacca Strait is uh, the closest sea link between the Pacific and Indian Oceans, uh, the shortest sea link, yes. excuse me. And uh, as a result, uh, if there is a blockage in the Malacca Straits, it will have a major impact on the Chinese economy both because energy will not be able to move, oil and gas will not be able to move and because their trade will be affected. So for them, the Malacca dilemma as they call it has been a very fundamental part of national security thinking since the early 2000s. Now Quad in a sense increases the anxiety because whereas uh, in their view no single country in the region is able to by itself block the Malacca Strait, mm -hmm. although the Andaman and Nicobar Islands are geographically very strategically positioned to do so, but they feel that if a grouping of countries, particularly that grouping which includes the United States with its massive naval capability and its technology come together, then there is a strong likelihood that they can sustainably block the Malacca Strait in the event of a crisis or a conflict. And therefore, the anxiety has tended to uh, increase. Now, the Quad has repeatedly said, at least as far as I'm aware, that they are not an anti-China grouping. India has very explicitly said this. The Prime Minister, in his statement at the Shangri-La Dialogue in 2018, has explicitly stated that India's Indo-Pacific outlook is not exclusive. 
it is not aimed at China. It is not a grouping or an exclusive members only club. Thereby clearly indicating that we certainly think China is not only an important part of the Indo-Pacific, but it must be part of the rule making as well. But in China, it suits them to craft the narrative of the Quad as an anti-China uh, platform mm -hmm. because it then allows them to build their navy, mm -hmm. to expand from the Pacific into the Indian Ocean, mm -hmm. to establish military bases in the region, all in the name of countering what they have described mm -hmm. as a quasi-military or a quasi-geo-strategic alliance. Mm -hmm. So it's a clever way of utilizing uh, a development which is not aimed at China uh -huh. by characterizing it as something aimed at China and then justifying what you are doing anyway as a reaction to that. Uh -huh. I guess it's part of diplomacy. Okay. So my next question is on uh, Chinese Communist Party. As you mentioned in your book, the CCP of uh, Mao era is different than what it is today. There is corruption in the party and it mostly comprises of urban rich. How do you think that they maintain ideological legitimacy? Is it by propaganda or mass surveillance? Yeah, of course, we can't compare Mao and Xi simply because China has fundamentally changed during this period. I think uh, President Xi Jinping is trying to use instruments of the constitution and the state to increase the party's role. So in other words, he is going on the legal route using the law, using legislation to strengthen the party's control over the institutions of the state. And he really does it by a variety of means. Within the party, new rules of how party members should act, what they can say and cannot say, whom they can meet and cannot meet have been put in place, which effectively gives President Xi and his close team complete control over the career trajectories of the party. Uh, and the party members. And that's a significant way in which you control the party from inside. As far as other government institutions are concerned, he has strengthened the party's control so that the party secretary in, let us say, the foreign ministry or the defense ministry or the agriculture ministry has a much bigger say in how that ministry's policies are run as compared to the minister in charge in those departments. So uh, that is the way they control the government. Uh, now, they also control the judiciary and the legislature by establishing party cells in these institutions. Okay. And they have gone so far as to now have a party cell in factories as well. Hmm. So the factory manager by himself or herself has to consult the party secretary of the factory before a decision is arrived at in terms even of production or uh, 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 financial allocations or resource allocations. Lastly, of course, they are now making Xi Jinping thought compulsory in schools, in universities. There are courses which are mandatory now. And through that process of indoctrination or propaganda also that is happening. So in a sense, the party is encroaching on all aspects of life. Uh, but it is still fundamentally different from the Maoist era. Because I think Xi Jinping's idea is not to disrupt society the way Mao did, but to take a greater grip on that society. Sir, uh, coming to India-China relations, you have extensively explained about Deng Rajiv Gandhi Modus Vivendi in your book. And there were very highs and lows in our relations since then. How do you think that we can resolve the border issue peacefully? Well, I think Galwan is a, in a sense a watershed. What happened in the Galwan Valley in, in uh, June 2020 uh, 20 is a watershed. Uh, the question now is where do you go from here because the previous framework is irretrievably broken to my mind. We have to build that new framework. Uh, now for that new framework to be built a dialogue has to begin. And so far we have not been able to initiate a sustained dialogue. So I think the first step is to start or restart a political dialogue. By political dialogue I do not mean necessarily that the dialogue begins at the level of head of state or government. It can begin at, the at, a, at a very official level or at a ministerial level, but it has to be sustained. It has to have meetings extended over a period of a year to 18 months at which new parameters and understandings are arrived at by the two sides on how to retrieve a situation from Galwan into a more stable, predictable regime. 
And I think that process has not yet begun. Once that process is established, I think we have to focus on three things. How to maintain peace and stability on the border region, which is the immediate priority. How to build a confidence building regime which will ensure that we don't get into conflictual situations, which is a legal treaty based kind of system. And finally, of course, how to settle that complicated territorial issue, which is a long term objective, which will ensure that there is never any conflict between them. We should not confuse the three stages. One can be done relatively easily, simply, uh, and that is how we maintain stability in the border. A second is much more complex, the boundary settlement, because history is involved. We claim on historical basis that a certain territory belongs to us. They claim on a different historical basis. We have to resolve those histories. Law is involved. Uh, if we are in possession of certain territories for over a hundred years, whose territory is it? Uh, then sentiment is involved. Uh, for India, the Himalayas have been part of our culture and civilization for centuries. Uh, the Chinese now claim that the Himalayas, the Karakorams have been a part of Tibetan civilization for centuries. So mm -hmm. sentiment is involved. And finally, political will is involved. So both the governments must be ready. Yes. And it, they must find it acceptable. They must find it uh, capable enough to sell an agreement to the people of their countries. Mm -hmm. So it is a very complex thing. There are many, many moving parts to it. And it takes time to do it. It's not insurmountable, but it will take time. And therefore, I think we should go step by step. Yes. Sir, I'll conclude with this question. There is increased focus on China research in India. What areas should young researchers focus on with respect to China? Well, I'm not sure there is a lot of research on China in India. That has been one of our problems. We tend to read a lot of Western literature on China and therefore our own views about China are also colored by Western perspectives, whereas we need to develop an Indian perspective on China. And that's one reason why I have written these books on China. I'm glad to see that in the younger generation, a number of scholars are coming up, working on different aspects. So there are scholars working on uh, what China is doing in semiconductors or other advanced industries. There are scholars working on why China's demographics are collapsing and what its implications are for the economy. I have read, read a recent report on why India-China trade is skewed and how India can improve upon that by, uh, uh, you know, by, by utilizing uh, the opportunities we have. I think our basic focus has to be on how we can become more competitive vis-a-vis -vis China. And for that, our policy makers need good research work on where is China going on science and technology in the key industries, uh, semiconductors, advanced materials, new energy solutions. Uh, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, how is that ecosystem being developed? Can India take lessons from that? Secondly, what is the demographic uh, uh, crisis in China going to do to its economy? Is China able to use technology to replace uh, human labor, for instance? Will that therefore mitigate the situation? Because we have to also understand that our population will peak at a certain point in 20 or 30 years and then follow a trajectory similar to China's. Can we learn today so that we avoid the mistakes China made while its demography <laughs> was growing? I think we also need to understand how is China doing digital currency? That's the way of the future. Yes. They are far ahead of us. Yes. What is their uh, experience been? How are they rolling out the, the pilot projects? Uh, then why is it that we handled the COVID crisis better than China overall? Yes. How did we wean ourselves off a pandemic much more successfully without a serious impact on social and economic stability, whereas in China the collapse was, it was immediate and the aftermath of the COVID crisis has been bad. So I guess there are a range of very, very relevant po public policy issues we should be looking at and I think any well-researched report will be of huge benefit to government and society. Sir, on that note, I thank you for giving me this opportunity to host you in this podcast. And also, I recommend this book to all international enthusiasts to gain an Indian perspective on rise of China. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Sir. Thank you, Nirbal.